Let's read from the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, beginning with verse number 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for this written word. And now we pray that your spirit might bless its reading and bless its hearing so that we hear in it a word that is from you. And that is for us on this very day. Now, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable unto you. Amen. What if I am wrong? I came up with that sermon title on Monday and typed it on my computer screen. But now that I say it out loud, it seems silly, doesn't it? What if I am wrong? You remember the Fonz on Happy Days? He couldn't easily admit that he was wrong, and when he tried to do so, the words got stuck in his mouth, and it came out something like, I, I was r r wrong. <laughs> what if I am r r wrong? For you see, there's a claim that I make, and I make it on a regular basis. If you came here just one or two times, you would be likely to hear it. If you're here every Sunday, then you might get tired of hearing it. I say it standing right here in this pulpit. I say it with a strong and certain voice. But what if I'm wrong? We claim, the claim I make is not unique to me, however. I'm not out on a limb by myself with this one. Others say it as well. In fact, it is so cliche, you might have seen it on bumper stickers and T-shirts and those cute little rubber wristbands that have messages of various sorts. But what if I and the others and the bumper stickers and the T-shirts and the wristbands, what if we're all wrong? I've been saying it for years. And by years, I mean I've been making this claim for decades. I've said it when there was evidence in front of me to make me feel certain that it was true. I said it when I had the privilege of performing the first same gender marriage in Alamance County of North Carolina in the immediate aftermath of the Supreme Court ruling which allowed for such celebrations. In the midst of that celebration, I was absolutely certain that I was right, that my claim is true. I said it when I had a front row seat to my father caring for my mother for years and years as if God had put him on this earth for that very purpose. Watching that, I felt certain that my claim was true. I've said it when baptizing infants for young parents who, despite all that is broken and dangerous and hard about this world, bring children into this life with the determination to love them enough to 
Help them find a path that leads to joy and meaningful living. And in those moments, I'm positive that I'm right. I've said it when marrying a couple and having one or both of them get choked up while repeating their vows and make those ugly crying faces, <laughs> which couldn't be more beautiful. I had this experience just yesterday. With the witness of such love right there in front of me, I am absolutely convinced that I'm right. But what if I'm not? What if I'm wrong? I've also said it, however, when the evidence before me made me wonder if it was true, if I was right. And I've said it then in the hopes that if I say it enough, and if others say it with me, you'll have a better chance to be true at the end of the day. I signed a petition this week from the United Church of Christ. The UCC asked for a lot of petitions to be signed. And I don't sign all of them. But when I ask, I did sign a petition calling for a permanent ceasefire between Palestine and Israel. It will ultimately be presented to the leaders of our government, calling upon them to act in ways which would contribute to the possibility of this outcome. One could argue that it's haughty. One could argue that it's foolish to think that putting one's signature on a petition is going to matter. But sometimes one just feels as if doing some small thing is better than doing nothing. And while signing it, I thought about that claim that I make so often. I made it to nobody but myself in the hopes that if said enough, my claim would be true. And this is it. You've heard me say it before. Love wins. Right? That's the claim that I make and that others make. That's the claim made by those colorful bumper stickers and t-shirts and wristbands. Love wins. At the end of the day when the earth and its inhabitants takes its final trajectory, it will be toward love's victory. Love wins. If I've said it once, I bet you that I've said it 10,000 times. Love wins. But what if I'm wrong? I was born a little too late to be a hippie. <laughs> Not by much, but just a little bit too late. And, and that's a shame because I would have been a good hippie. <laughs> Don't you agree, honey? I would have made a really good hippie. Now, my hair would have grown out that way instead of long, but despite that awkward look, other than that, I would have made a good hippie. I look out over this congregation, and I, I, I see some folks that I bet drove one of those VW, those little VW buses, you know? Yeah. yeah, I'm not the only one. I would have made a good hippie, and my hippie friends would have joined with me in singing the truth, the sentiment that love wins. But what if me and my imaginary hippie friends are wrong? Someone who I admire, someone whose voice I have appreciation for, someone whom I respect, someone who I have referred to as a modern day prophet wrote something that I read and suggested the possibility that I'm wrong about that claim, at least partially so. His name is John Pavlovich. He's a, a writer, a blogger, a speaker. And one of his articles caught my eye. The title of it was, Stop Saying That Love Wins. For the sake of al allowing Mr. Pavlovich a fair chance to prove me wrong, I'm going to offer you a quote that is longer than the, most of the quotes that I would intersperse among my own words. But let's hear him out. He doesn't suggest that victory isn't possible, that it, but he does suggest that love isn't enough. I'm going to have to tone down his language. Mr. Pavlovich is not employed by a church, and he can say some things... <laughs> He can say some things in public that I can't say. So here's the toned down version. 
Stop saying love wins. Courageous, empathetic, angry people armed with sacrificial love, fully participating in the affairs of the world and relentlessly engaging the broken systems around them will win. Wherever the disparate, sprawling army of compassionate human beings spend themselves on behalf of other people, when they keep going despite being exhausted, when they refuse to tire of doing the right thing, when they will not be shamed into silence, then love will be winning. Love isn't some mysterious force, he wrote, outside of our grasp and beyond our efforts that exists disconnected from us. It's not supernatural magic. It's hard work. It's caring about our families, neighbors, strangers, and exercising that impulse in measurable ways. Love, he said, is ornamental and worthless until it moves from aspiration to incarnation. And all the apologies to those waiting on God, God is not going to magically make things right either. That's not part of the deal. God or the universe or whatever you believe holds this place together isn't fixing this planet without a decisive and sustained movement of empathetic human beings. We who are harboring a ferocity for diverse humanity, which is born of our moral convictions, are going to need to move in order to make right all that is so terribly wrong. We're going to have to sacrifice sleep, or relationships or comfort in order to step into the messy, jagged trenches of this messed up day and unmess it. And I can't tell you how much editing I had to do for that <laughs> sentence. What will alter the story we find ourselves in is kind-hearted, prayerful people who reflect fully on the fractures and the malignancies and injustices in front of them and decide that they will change what they can change and do what they are able to do. And he concluded by saying, theology is embodied or it is useless. For someone who suggested that I am wrong, I have a hard time disagreeing with anything that he said. But perhaps we aren't in that much disagreement at all. Love, the kind which is transformative, is indeed a verb. And when collections of people apply the verbs of speaking in love and doing in love, there is a spirit which can be entrusted to empower and embolden them in their speaking and in their doing. But that, sp that spirit can't empower. It cannot empower in the midst of silence and inertia. John Pavlovich and I might both turn to the words we have read this morning in John's gospel to make our points. Jesus' words are a strong and stringent call to love, but make no mistake, the love to which he speaks and calls his followers is action-oriented. It is a call to sacrifice. It is connected to commands of doing. It is associated with the bearing of fruit. There are two concepts from this passage that I want to press on a bit as we prepare to come to this table together. Friendship and this concept of being chosen. This concept of friendship permeates this entire passage and Jesus' description of the faith community of which he finds himself the center. He calls his followers not servants, but friends. He suggests plainly that a characteristic of transformative love involves a willingness to lay down one's life, one's friends. Friendship in this community is more than trite affection. It is more than a click on a social media page. 
It involves a deep mutual commitment to one another. And then Jesus suggests that they're being together, this band of friends being together. That it is not a result of them choosing Jesus, but that it is a result of Jesus choosing them. Let's leave those there for just a moment. It is time for my annual I Must Go Into the Woods speech. Some of you are fully aware, and this will be repetitive for you. Others are partially aware, and maybe this will just clear some things up. And some of you are new enough not to be aware of this at all. I am shared by this church as an employee by Johns River Valley Camp, which is an outdoor ministry of the United Church of Christ. During the summer, we host camps for youth and children. On our best days, we see the lives of some of those youth and children changed. On days which are less than our best, we just try to keep everybody in one piece. Once June gets here, you will see me on a few Sundays, but for the most part, I will be in those woods from June till the first week of August or so. What I've discovered in my first three years of doing this is that you get along disappointingly well in my absence. Sometimes I return only to be told you didn't know I was gone. <laughs> this summer will be the same in that respect. But what makes this I must go into the woods speech different than the others is that it is my last. In the fall, I'll be busy transitioning a, a new person into to that position. But when December 31st, of 2024 gives way to January 1st of 2025, I will be your full-time pastor. When the ball drops in Times Square, you can imagine me somewhere clapping like a seal on speed. <laughs> yeah, because I, I'm not kidding. I'm ready for the moment. When that time comes, you will have every right to expect more of me than you do right now. And I encourage you to do that expecting, because I might expect more from you as well. That's what friends do, and we are friends. We will strive together as we already have to determine what it is we have been chosen to do. Chosen doesn't mean better. Chosen doesn't mean we're more enlightened. Chosen doesn't mean that we are above. Chosen means simply that we find ourselves in a particular time, in a particular place, and we share a particular moment in the history of this world, and we are chosen to be a particular voice and to put love into action in particular ways. You have a history of doing this already. There are ways in which we are doing it now. I am simply telling you that I am longing for that day when we as friends will be able to do it in a new way. And that day is coming. And despite the noble and articulate call of John Pavlovich, I will continue both in my halftime role and in my full-time role when that comes to say that love wins. But that prophet, and I think he is a prophet, is on the prophetic mark when he reminds us that love doesn't win until it becomes a verb acted out by flesh and blood and perfect people who know that they have been chosen and who do not shy away from that call. Last Sunday, during our Earth Day celebration, we heard a beautiful quote which I had never heard before. I found it to be so poetic that I thought it made a good closing for this sermon. The quote had a, a new age kind of ring to it, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I was still pleased to find out that it goes all the way back in church, church history to one of the fathers, Augustine of Hippo. It goes like this. Hope has two beautiful daughters. 
Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they don't remain as they are. May it be that those two beautiful daughters will be born right here among us. Right in the midst of the hope that we embrace as friends together. As we walk this path, which in some ways we've chosen, but in some other grander ways, is a path that has been chosen for us. Amen.